we're just having a bit of trouble getting the teleconference number up. Just a reminder to everyone also um, that just over there is my phone, which is actually transmitting on YouTube at the moment. So um, these uh, four little talks are going worldwide for other government administrations and, and others around the world. So um, just, just, just a reminder that this is an all of government and not a specifically an, an ATO events so and it's being broadcast outside so for any of the ATO staff members just remember that we can't see anything that we're not allowed to say outside. Good morning everybody, we, we had a little bit of difficulty with the web WebEx login but um, we're just getting things going now. No, it's just for the it's just for the phone. Um, though on the invitation there was a YouTube link to where we are broadcasting video. Oh, yeah, cool. Is that link up and running yet? I've been to the site and um, yes. was it test about ten minutes ago or so. Yeah, it should be up now. Richard, are you on the phone yet? Uh, yes, I am here to wait. I'm just going to do a, a brief uh, couple of comments before, and I'll hand over to you when I'm finished. Uh, you okay, you may end up coming to the territory then. The, oh no, it's just a, uh, a, just okay. a few thank yous and a, just an announcement. I won't be covering anything that you'll be covering. Okay, can someone announce the YouTube link? It's on the email. Uh, Tony says it's on the email. Uh, I couldn't see it either. 
When you go to the email, the link in the email that actually just takes you to Tony Nolan's channel, I'm going to try the, yes, when you, oh, the live now. So when you go to the channel, the top link says Warwick, and if you click on that, that's live now, that should work. Yes. It's working for me. Yeah, that's working. I'm joining that now. Sorry, can you send that instruction again? When you're at the Tony Nolan's page, yes. The top link um, is called Warwick, um, and it doesn't have a picture or anything, and, uh, and it says live now. You should be able to tap on that, and it starts playing. Um, are you using um, Are you using a uh, uh, Firefox? Uh, I'm actually on the iPad. Um, I can't use um, my desktop because we block YouTube. <laughs> uh, okay, so it's not coming up on um, not coming up on Internet Explorer. That thing. No, it does come okay. up. On, it does come up on Firefox throughout the office. But anyway, we we need to get going. So, um, Warwick, if you'd like to. Yeah. Okay. For those who don't know me, my name is Warwick Granko. I'm an employee of the ATO working what's called Smarter Data. I'm also, I wear another hat, that is I'm convener of the whole of government data analytics center of excellence. And this is a center of excellence uh, event today. Uh, I'm not going to introduce the uh, today's session. That'll be done by Assistant Commissioner Richard Collis, who will join us speak to you very shortly. What I'm just going to do, just a, a couple of other quick things which I'm going to do now rather than at the end of this, I'm going to just express a number of thank yous to certain parties that have made today's event possible. That inc includes Analytics First, which is a, a collection of data scientists run by Eugene Dubasarski, who in the room today will be speaking later. Uh, the Australian Institute of Professional Intelligence Officers is another. Uh, the IEEE has also helped to contribute to today's session. Another organisation who I don't know what the letters stand for, but it's got the acronym SSIT, uh, have also helped to contribute to today's session. GovHack is another, uh, and Prime Minister and Cabinet. But the person I most want to thank you is Tony Nolan, who's sitting here on my right. Uh, Tony's been like a ferocious bull pit terrier in organising today's event and uh, he's put in an enormous effort. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Just one other thing I want to mention, this is for government employees, that uh, we're having another Centre of Excellence event on the 29th of November in Canberra. It's what we call a user group round table and it's... Uh, uh, we're not certain if we can broadcast it externally out of Canberra yet, we're still trying to sort that problem out. But it's going to be focused on digital assistance and the use of that technology. And I've got a fellow by the name of Robert uh, Bollard from Intellectual Property Australia, or what was more commonly called IP Australia. He'll be uh, attending and he'll be telling the audience the experience that IP Australia has had using digital assistance. And by digital assistance, I'm talking about bots. And I'm also talking about cognitive computing and, and a few other technologies like robo advisors. So that's all I wanted to say. I'm just now going to hand over to Assistant Commissioner Richard Collins, who will make the introduction. Over to you, Richard. Thank you, Warwick, and good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I feel like a bit of a fraud, given the amount of work that Tony's uh, uh, Tony has put into putting this together. He really does deserve the accolades that Warwick has given him. Uh, I am, as uh, Warwick said, an assistant commissioner within uh, the Australian Taxation Office within the Smarter Data Work uh, Unit. Um, I've previously chaired the uh, Cross Federal Department um, Data and Analytics Centre of Excellence Forum that um, we recently concluded. But the Data and Analytics Centre of Excellence Community of Practice, which is uh, an ongoing, enduring feature, and that uh, Warwick now leads for us, is um, responsible for putting today's together and for putting together today's events on, on our collective behalf. And so, thank you to Warwick and uh, Tony for putting that on. Um, the mandate of this community of practice is actually to support and inform and enhance the skills of the Australian Public Service with regards to data and analytics. And so. The intention for today's session is to actually um, allow you to hear from four speakers on various topics that uh, we think are uh, topical and interesting.
interesting and hopefully this will incite some conversation and discussion towards the end and give us some ideas for the next step forward. You are going to hear some four speakers today. Uh, Warwick Graco will be speaking to us about this digital fingerprinting. Um, Thank you, Richard. Okay, I'm going to uh, give the first presentation. As you can see, it's up there on the screen. It's uh, about digital fingerprinting. And this All is... All participants have been muted. Uh, this is... Uh, you can hear me? Okay, if I continue. Yeah. This is an issue I'm very passionate about. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, as you'll see when I get the right slide, it's not something new. It's actually... is already occurring, so I'm not telling you, taking you to talk about something that's has not yet happened. Uh, I'm also, uh, just before I launch into it, I'm just uh, going to skip some slides. I'm also probably going to uh, not address some of the bullet points that are on the slides. I'm doing that simply because we're a little bit behind schedule. I only have 20 minutes to give this presentation and I just want to make certain I get through it in the time available. So, but if you want copies of the slides, uh, you're quite welcome to have them. Uh, there's nothing secret or going to burn a hole in the desk with this, with this presentation. So uh, if you are uh, not able to write down or capture what I'm covering, like I said, you're quite welcome to get the slides. Okay, let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to, uh, as I said, skip a few and I'm just going to get straight into this simply because, uh, as I said, I don't want to waste time that's available. But on this slide here, uh, I'm not, uh, you probably uh, may or may not be aware of the fact that you're being profiled 24-7 uh, each, uh, uh, sorry, each week of the year. And it's been done by service providers such as Microsoft, Yahoo, Google. So every time you log on to say Microsoft, you may not be aware of it, but you're there watching what you're doing what keystrokes you use, how you respond to screens, and they're trying to determine what it is that uh, you're likely to use or what you're attracted to be uh, on the screens that they provide. Uh, they use a whole variety of different data, uh, and I've got listed their examples down the bottom, demographic, geographic, socioeconomic, psychographic, and record and transactional data. And they're, they're only examples of the data they can use. If you're not familiar with the term psychographic, it's the word used in marketing, and it refers to measurements of your uh, personality, your interests, your attitude, your lifestyle, and things like that. And marketing companies are collecting that data 24-7 and using it to try and understand you better as a customer. The thing that's coming uh, is the Internet of Machines, also the Internet of Things. It's got various titles. These are going to be very small microscopic devices that will be implanted in everything. You get your name, your clothing, the walls of a building, your car, the parks and gardens, agriculture fields, and so on. And the amount of data that these uh, internet and machines will generate, I can only say the mind will boggle in terms of the data that will be generated. Because this data will be collected around the clock going to come from a huge number of sources and it's going to 
God, just an absolute deluge of data. Okay, the term digital fingerprinting, fingerprinting, sorry, has two meanings. Uh, one is it refers to a unique code that's put on electronic type uh, transmissions like a, a data file, and it's there to try and protect the integrity of that document or file. In, in the sense, if anyone does tamper with the contents, then uh, that then is captured, and they know the document has been compromised in some way. But what I'm referring to when I use the term digital fingerprinting is not that. I'm talking about the fact that your hand, you have your fingers and that has, has fingerprints, but uh, you too establish a fingerprint every time you use a computer. So what I'm talking about is a uh, uh, unique signature that you have, because the way you uh, use computers, the issues that you address, the way you express things provides a signature of you, you as a person. And we can capture that signature so that we understand who you are and how you operate. Now fingerprinting can be used for a whole laundry list of reasons. And here on slide six, uh, I list them and these are only examples. The sky's the limit to what fingerprinting could be used. Uh, and I've got there some fairly important issues like suspects in a crime, uh, security risks, those who are profitable customers, elite sportsmen, women, and so on. I'm not going to go through the whole list. All I want to get across to you here, this can be used for a multitude of purposes. In terms of how fingerprinting is done, uh, uh, there's probably many different ways of doing it, but I've got up here, just for the sake of examples, the use of configuration techniques. And these are employed to identify uh, the signatures of people. And uh, there are two ways of doing this. One is that you could profile people using expert judgment and the police force, uh, when there's a crime scene, profile a crime scene to try and figure out what, who is the likely suspects or suspect that, that committed a crime. And that's one example where profiling is used. Uh, there are those who work in the uh, customer world that are cust profiling customers using human judgment. Uh, could use it for medical profiling in terms of profiling patients. So I just want to give you a flavour of what I mean by profiling. But you can also use data mining methods to do this. And, um, and data mining methods can discover the profiles of people. And I've got there, at the bottom there, a graphical um, representation of what I mean by profiles. How this is done, uh, if we go to the next one, there are two sort of techniques that can be used, but these are two of many. These are not the only methods that can be used. And the first one there, configurable frequency analysis, is a technique that's come out of the psychometric world. If you're not familiar with the term psychometric, it's referring to how you measure behavior. And there are psychologists who specialize in the measurement of behavior, and they come up with many and varied techniques. And one of these is called configurable frequency analysis and I've got there an example at the bottom if you take fluids and, as an example we, there are various symptoms that indicate you have flu and you can get different configurations of those patterns there which are the pluses and minuses which means you have the symptom or you don't have the symptom and there are a few other tricks to configurable frequency analysis but I just want to give you the simplistic explanation here you can work out the frequency of each of those patterns and when you do that, you can work out what are the likely symptoms that indicate you have flu. If I talk about configuration mining, uh, I'm not going to go into the techniques used here because that would mean going off on a tangent and having to spend a fair amount of time explaining how that is done. Uh, if you wish to um, find out from me what some of these techniques are, just come and see me. But 
Essentially, if I go back to the previous slide where we've got that diagram down there where you've got the attributes at the bottom, the scores at the side, and you've got those profiles there, essentially uh, configuration mining is uh, about finding out which attributes define the profiles. Not all attributes are important. Some are, some are not. So getting the attributes sorted out is the first step. And then once you get those attributes, then identifying scores that people uh, have for each of those attributes. And there are mining techniques which can be used to work out what are the common configurations within those, um, the data. Now, configuration mining is um, uh, also enables you to identify what are called typologies. And typologies are basically a uh, profile that best describes a collection of people who have got very similar uh, profiles. Uh, for those familiar with clustering techniques, it's sort of uh, based on clustering. But I've given you there uh, three actual typologies that exist in the real world. They're not uh, ones that have been made up. And we're talking about arsonists, people who light fires. Uh, and the three, I think, are fairly self-explanatory. You've got the financially motivated arsonists, the ones that build the money, collect insurance. You've got the thrill-seeking type that does it because they get a kick out of lighting fires. And then you've got the third type, which is unfortunately uh, a problem we have here in Australia, that is the one who wants to be seen as the hero saving the community from a fire. So they deliberately light fires to be seen to be doing that. And some of the major fires we've had in Australia have actually been lit by these type of people. Each of those uh, arsonists has a signature, a, a defining profile, and you can find them in data if you're using the right attributes. Now getting to uh, uh, proxy indicators. Um, uh, proxy indicators are also very important and I'm going to uh, now for the rest of this presentation talk about how we can use proxy indicators to basically work out the signature of people and, and these proxy indicators can be very important because they can bring to the surface people who would otherwise remain invisible. Now proxy indicators are used for uh, working out climate change. I don't know if you're aware of that, uh, in the sense that scientists rely on measurements that they get from the things I've listed there, like ice cores where they dig into the Antarctic or the Arctic to extract the ice that's there. And they can tell from the further they dig the uh, ball into the ice uh, what has happened historically. The rings of a tree, if you cut a tree down, you will see there's concentric, sort of concentric rings on a where the tree's been cut down, that can tell you a lot about the history of a tree. Obviously fossils tell you a lot about uh, climate change, as does coral, as does lake and ocean sediments. Now I've, put, I've got that bottom point there. One indicator uh, is usually not sufficient to give a, a reliable guide on an issue. You really need uh, a combination of indicators to gain assurance. By gain assurance, I mean you actually are measuring what it is you're, you're trying to measure. Now we live in the world of uh, big data and it's a term that you often hear these days. For some of you it may be a fairly vague term in a sense you're not quite certain what it means but it refers to data that's big, it's messy, it's mixed and it's uh, a horrible mess at times. Uh, and uh, since about the year 2000, we've seen an absolute upsurge in the amount of data being collected in the world. Uh, it's reached a point now where we just don't have the storage capacity to store all the data that's being collected. Uh, because the, the data being collected just far exceeds what we're able to store. We're also now in the era of fast data. That's data that comes very quickly from transactions, so like every time you go to a bank, say, uh, get a, put a deposit in or take money out, that's a transaction. And that now is also being collected and it's referred to as fast data. And also very soon we'll be in the era of what's called smart data. And by that I mean data that has some sort of 
meaning to it that we can extract and understand and we're rapidly moving towards achieving what's called smart data. All this data that we're collecting and recognising it's a huge amount of data that's been collected all provide indicators of particular traits and particular tendencies that people have. So what I'm going to do now is just illustrate where I'm coming from. And I've got here proxy examples of proxy indicators. You may not know it, but the way you use a telephone can indicate whether or not you're likely to pay you off your debts. There's been research done which showed that uh, people who have a variable pattern of behavior in using telephones and use them in different locations are more likely to pay their debts than those who don't show that pattern. You might say that's rubbish, I don't believe it, but it's actually based on solid hard research. Your viewing habits can tell us a lot about you on, in terms of what you watch on television. Uh, it can predict who you'll vote for when it comes to a political party. It can tell us what health issues you may have in the future, like heart disease, uh, obesity, diabetes. And it can also tell us whether or not you're a safe driver. And it's been found, again, this has come from research, and if you want to cite the research, just write to me and I'll provide you with the papers. Uh, you know, if you watch particular programs on television, like uh, uh, Top Gear, I believe, is one, a car program, uh, there's been research done which has shown that people who tend to watch these programs tend to be safer drivers. Why? Because they know the risks in high speed driving. So all of these things can tell us a lot about you. And I've got there, you know, what music you collect, you know, your colour preferences, your choice of clothing. All of this provides indicators that we can use uh, to work out uh, what your signature is. I'll skip this slide. Uh, now, one technique we can use to um, identify these proxy indicators is what's called affinity mining. And affinity mining is a generic term that refers to different types of mining, uh, one of which is called association mining. And a, a affinity mining is all about working out what collection or combinations of things tend to be associated with something. For example, uh, you hear often the example used of what items you buy in a supermarket. Uh, and super, you know, people who own supermarkets like Woolworths and Coles here in Australia, they're very interested in what items you buy when you go to a supermarket. And they can use association mining, that's the technical term used, to work out what those collections are, and that way they know what to stock the shelves with. Now we can use that type of mining too to find out what proxy indicators may be associated with a particular signature, and I've got there an example where I've got the signature, and coupled to it are four indicators, and I've got there, this is a hypothetical example I might express, it's not one from uh, any research that's been done, but you know, that, that signature coupled with those four uh, indicators occurs 5% of the time in the population. So this is a technique that we can use to work out which of those proxy indicators may be coupled, and I use the word coupled strongly because we're talking about something that's linked or connected rather than something that's correlated with a particular pattern of behaviour. Okay, I'm nearly finished. Uh, I just thought I'll conclude by talking about some of the ethical privacy and security issues here, because the use of proxy indicators uh, does raise uh, many legal and associated issues. And I will stress before I uh, continue on, uh, and it's not in the bullet points there on the slide, that the law tends to lag by about 10 years behind where technology is. So the use of proxy indicators, if that became the norm, it will probably take legislators anything up to 10 years to catch up with this particular development. So I just stress that point. However, 
for some of you and maybe all of you, you know, you could see this posing uh, threats to the liberties, privacy, and prosperity of individuals. For example, people could be denied employment because they have certain personality traits that others do not like, and that could be seen to be blatant discrimination. And therefore, as I've said, certain sections of the community may oppose this practice. However, I offer you these observations. There are many things in our society that potentially are dangerous, and I've got examples there, vehicles. You know, vehicles are misused, you don't need me to tell you what can happen there. Fire, firearms, knives, saws, and the list is a long one. But we have not banned the use of those uh, items because they all serve uh, very socially and other uh, sort of useful purposes. But we do need rules to govern the use of such tools that are dangerous so that we minimise, of course, the physical and psychological damage that can be done. I suggest, and we don't have this at present, we need a regulatory authority to oversee and prosecute those who overstep the mark, uh, what is called the creepy line. Uh, that's a term that's used in uh, my profession. Um, when people, uh, you know, misuse data and illegal techniques for unethical or for criminal purposes. And one thing we don't have at present is a code of ethics to govern the use of data. And while we've got privacy laws, I, I don't think we really have much more than that to govern the use of data. And uh, one of the challenges probably lying in the future is to come up with a code of ethics and also to probably come up with an appropriate code, criminal code, to govern the use of data. Another very important requirement is those who do digital fingerprinting need to demonstrate both the validity and the reliability of their findings. In other words, I spoke before about those proxy indicators like the TV viewing habits, the telephone use, usage. It's absolutely not, it's not even critical, it's a must do for people who come up with these findings to demonstrate that their results are scientific, that they can be uh, uh, replicated. By replicated, if someone else did the same research, they too will have, you know, achieve the same findings, or provide the same findings. And also, you've got to demonstrate that those findings either predict or demonstrate what it is that they're associated with. Like, if I say you're a security risk, and I'd say indicators X, Y, and Z indicate you are a security risk. I've got to prove that those indicators do predict you are a security risk. So that's what I mean by the validity. And the last point I've got there is we can't ignore the gift or stasis in the place. And by that I mean you know digital fingerprinting while it can be used for all the wrong reasons. It can also confer many advantages, many benefits to the community like it could help uh, identify people who are going to be dangerous drivers before they actually kill someone. They can identify people who may be going to uh, be guilty of, say, domestic violence. So steps can be taken to try and minimise it and, if possible, prevent that. So that's what I'm talking about, you know, the importance of this and why we need to treat it seriously. So in conclusion, uh, digital fingerprinting is a new development another product of the digital revolution. It, it's an example of where we can use big data, fast data and analytics uh, to demonstrate you know, uh, how we can uh, do that process. As I've said, it, it's a major advantage. It can give society the wherewithal to prevent rather than cure issues. And by that, I mean the old medical saying, prevention is better than cure. Because if we prevent things, we're gonna save heaps of money. If we've got to cure it, that means we're probably going to spend a lot more than we'd like to. And the last slide, it also means we can identify those who are threats to the community and, and people who can do great harm so we can uh, you know, uh, do things to uh, prevent that happening. And therefore, that will confer many economic and uh, social benefits. So that's all I wanted to cover. I'm sorry if this went a bit quickly, but as I said, time dictated I do that. So I'm going to now hand over to Tony and Tony uh, is uh, 
if I may say so, one of the most innovative persons I've ever come across. The techniques he's about to describe to you are ones that he, he alone, has come up with. Uh, he never ceases to amaze me if, uh, with these techniques that he devises. Uh, Tony has primarily a, a intelligence background, but uh, sort of has, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, been spending uh, quite some time now in the analytics world as well, and has sort of bridged that gap between the intelligence world and the analytics world, and uh, as I said, has come up with some incredible ways of finding things in data. And uh, I'm going to hand over to him because I think he's going to now explain to you what's called uh, the work he's been doing with cohort analysis. Um, just what we've got to do for a second or two is I've got to stop the YouTube video um, and then restart it again. So those people who are watching on YouTube, of which there are over 50 at the moment, um, and so that should be back on for you to click on in about a, a minute. So Warwick, did you want to ask a question or yeah. receive a question or anything quickly while I do this? Sure. Any questions? Dan Wilson, Matt Wilson. 